Thanks for joining us for this series, Great Minds with Michael Medved, where we focus on eternal questions, big questions that don't go away and don't get old. But sometimes those very questions uh, overlap very directly with some of the controversies in current events and current disputes. For instance, uh, if you look back at the 2016 election, one of the factors in that election was tremendous anxiety that many, many Americans felt about their jobs. Uh, will those jobs even exist in the future? It's interesting to think about that because, oh, for instance, there used to be literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who earned their living as elevator operators. Not so much anymore. What about jobs, period, for human beings? Will human beings be replaced by machines. In fact, are humans obsolete? Uh, that's our topic for this edition of Great Minds with Michael Medved, and I'm privileged to be joined by one of those great minds, best-selling author, senior fellow of the Discovery Institute. Discovery Institute is kind enough to sponsor this series. Uh, his name is Jay Richards. He is a professor of business and economics at the Catholic University of America, and Dr. Richards is a philosopher and an economist and much, much more. He has also uh, written a fascinating book about this very question as to whether or not human beings are replaceable by machines, which is the subject of so many science fiction movies. Uh, Jay, it's great to be speaking with you. Thank you, Michael. What about that uh, core question? Mm -hmm. um, do you believe that there is a time, and it may not be long advanced, that human beings will become obsolete? I don't. Uh, I, and in saying that, I'm contradicting about 20 books that have been <laughs> written in the last couple of years. Uh, in fact, just in the last two years, Martin Ford, who is himself a tech entrepreneur, wrote a book called Rise of the Robots, in which he predicts, uh, essentially, maybe in the next 10 to 20 years, uh, that the vast majority of jobs that people are doing right now will be replaced. They'll either be automated by com computers or they'll be replaced by robots. Uh, and he and many other people advocate something like a universal basic income because they think, okay, there are going to be a few tech trillionaires that are going to run all the robot factories, essentially, and it's going to leave 50, 80 percent of the population unemployed. So what do these people do? And so this is what really kind of got me interested in this issue is that people both, there's both the philosophical question, right? Can we actually be replaced by machines? It's also this policy question, because if this actually is going to happen, then we might, we might agree to, to drastic uh, policy uh, consequences. But I think it, it fundamentally makes a mistake, a philosophical error. And it's, if you look at any of the literature, if you look at especially the sort of extreme people in this debate, the transhumanists, uh, they just simply assume from the beginning that human beings are machines. And so if we ourselves are merely machines, then, of course, our machines, in principle, could become more powerful than, the, than we are, could completely replace every single thing, not only that we do, but that we are. On the other hand, if human beings are agents with intentions and purposes and machines are not, then that means that we can create machines that may replace many of the things that we do, but they will nevertheless be the un uniquely human capacities. And I think that's actually, that's the real lesson in what we ought to be talking about. What do we need to do when many machines are doing things that humans were previously doing? Not what do we do once we're completely replaced? I think that's based on, on bad philosophy and, and, and bad metaphysics. Well, for the people who do assume that human beings could be completely replaced by machines mm. that could even do things better than we right. do them, what do they suspect? Uh, remaining human beings would do to occupy their time? Well, it, it goes in a dystopian and a utopian direction. So the, the utopians uh, are writing a lot about sex, quite frankly. They're talking a lot about uh, really fine-tuned sex robots. They're talking about virtual sex and all sorts of new experiences that Wait, we have. Why would those robots need us? No, they, 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 they wouldn't necessarily, though they're perhaps designed to do, to do that, to serve sort of human ends. Remember, I said this is the utopian view. Right. Uh, the dystopian view is that you know don't 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 think of the worst one. Don't think of Skynet and Terminator. Just think <laughs> of a world in which uh, all the things we actually need—food and housing and healthcare and all these things—are actually done and done better by machines. So that 
the work that most of us do and that gives our life meaning from day to day is gone. I think that by itself is a, a very dystopian vision, even if we're even if we're served, right? Even it's something like uh, Brave New World, not 1984, but Brave New World, in which everyone seems chipper, they're happy, they're all having sex with each other, they're taking this drug soma, and yet they've lost their souls. It's when you read the book, no one reads the book and thinks, "Oh, this is a wonderful prediction. I hope we get there." But that that's that that's a that's a scary vision. The idea that we could have machines that that feed us and give us all of our creature comforts, but that actually deprive us of the very thing for most of us that gives us meaning, which is our capacity to create value with and for others. Uh, the, uh, the book begins, your new book, mm. with the story of a couple uh, called the Seegers, Daniel yes. and Kelly. Uh, what happened with them? Well, they're the perfect story of what I call the transition from the second uh, American dream to the third American dream. The second American dream of the 20th century was bound up in home ownership. And I know even in my generation X person, owning a home was a major part of my sort of my view of what it meant to succeed. Uh, and they bought a home in August of 2008. He was, uh, Daniel Seeger is a personal trainer at a fitness place and his wife, uh, Kelly, was, was selling memberships. They saved up enough money to buy a house. And on Monday, he lost all of his clients and her hours were cut back because of the financial crisis. So you say, okay, well, well, what would they do at this point? Well, they, they could have gone on the dole. They could have gotten depressed, right? Uh, what they actually did is said, okay, what skill and gift do we have? Daniel Seeger said, I can explain working out as well as anyone. And so they bought a few hundred dollars worth of video equipment, painted a wall in their garage, and started making little workout videos and putting them on YouTube and then really getting customer feedback from what people want, wanted. So this, this starts in 2008. It becomes a full-time job in 2010. At the moment, they have well over 4 million subscribers on YouTube. Uh, this was all made possible by technology that no doubt has displaced many other types of jobs. And that's the thing uh, that, pe that, that dystopians always miss. I mean, you could have said that the Industrial Revolution was going to destroy civilization. Well, it displaced a heck of a lot of farmers. The American founding, 95% of the population were farmers. In 1900, half the population were farmers. Now it's 1%. So all that farming labor, you could think, well, what are all these people going to do? Well, it turns out that what happens is that we reorient our labor toward higher value uses of our work. So my mom's family, they all got college educations. They could have done what their family had done in previous generations and picked cotton. None of them did it because they didn't have to and because they didn't, they didn't want to. I think that's actually what's going to take place now. We're at the cusp of a, this, we're, we're at the joint from the industrial revolution to the sort of information revolution. And I think we're actually really at the beginning of it. We're gonna see massive job displacement. But the question isn't, will jobs be displaced? Um, the question is, what do we need to do and how do we need to orient ourselves to take advantage of the new opportunities that, that will happen in, in, uh, in the wake of this job displacement? We're very close, aren't we, to driverless cars? Absolutely, doing that. yeah. What happens to the several million Americans mm -hmm. and American families who uh, are Teamsters? I think the Teamsters Union is still the biggest single yes. union, people who drive for a living. What happens to people who drive for a living when you have driverless vehicles? They're not making a living driving cars. I mean, that's the irony. And of course, right, we're at the moment right now where uh, the peer-to-peer -peer programs like Uber and Lyft are essentially displacing the kind of monopolistic taxi industry. That's a wonderful opportunity, and it's a kind of temporary solution because Uber and Lyft are also going to go automated. In fact, I think long-haul trucks will probably be automated first. It's much simpler if you're on an interstate highway and you're not dealing with customers, or if you're in, if you're in downtown Seattle, you're dealing with other cars, you're dealing with sanctimonious bicyclists, right? Uh, and in many states, the top Maybe job we for men. Maybe them with machines. Yes, <laughs> that's right. The, the, bi the bicyclist, exactly. And so there are many, many Americans who make a living doing long haul trucking. Those jobs are going to go away. Uh, assembly line factory work is simply going to go away because, as you know, socialists were saying 100 years ago, the assembly line is, in a sense, men doing the work of machines. They're doing repetitive work. That's those jobs are going to disappear, and I don't think there's really anything we can do about it. The question is. What ought we to do both to prepare for what I do think is inevitable, and I think in the long run will make us all better off. It's going to displace entire industries, including some industry towns, 
that are built around this industrial way of doing things. So. so part of what you're saying is that the real problem with displacement has not been jobs moving overseas. No. It's been jobs going to machines. Absolutely. What's, what's a prominent example of one industry where you've seen massive job loss because of automation yeah. already? Well, I mean, even the, even the ones we hear about, even these autom automotive factories and places like that, probably two-thirds of the jobs lost in that type of manufacturing since 1980 have been the, as the result of automation, not outsourcing and not offshoring. Well, one example that people don't know about is computers. In 1945, the word computer was a job description. Uh, it was people, mostly women, that had to do computing for uh, accounting firms and all sorts of things. That's right. In that uh, movie uh, uh, the, uh, about the hidden figures. Yes, about exactly. The, they were called computers. Computers. The, women, the black women who were exactly. uh, featured in that film yeah. were referred to as computers they were. because they were at and the time. That's right. And that's, that's exactly the what they did. No, yeah. and, and now we, most people, certainly under 40, don't even realize that the word computer until a few decades ago, was a job description. That would be, trust me, uh, you know, call your date a computer now. They're not going to take that as a compliment. All completely disappeared. Uh, all of the kind of repetitive manufacturing is going to disappear. Now, what, what a lot of people think that's not true is that manual labor will disappear. In fact, in some ways, it's a lot of the mental work that computers can do in insurance and just adjusting, a lot of the stuff that doctors do that I think is going to be done by machines. Uh, Gardeners, uh, housekeepers, painters, masons, things that involve complex bodily movements are actually going to be the very last things to replace because it's called Moravex paradox. You, essentially, we can get machines that can beat the grandmaster at chess. It's very hard to get a machine that can actually do what any three-year-old can do with his hands and his legs. And so uh, the sort of trade skills, the trade jobs, uh, electricians and plumbers, that require complex bodily movements, not factory work. Those are actually going to be around, I think, much longer. But I do not think that there's, there's any hope for, uh, for the type of factory work in which people are doing things that are easily automatable. Uh, well, what about um, the, the idea that we all want right now to help make uh, Americans more upwardly mobile, yes. to help raise our standard of living, which, which everybody wants regardless Absolutely. of your politics? is uh, greater economic growth. Mm. And the essence to greater economic growth, every economist agrees, and I'm yep. sure you do too, uh, is productivity. Absolutely. And the essence of productivity <laughs> is efficiency, yes. and that means more machines, not have. fewer machines. Yeah. But then again, if we're going to inevitably move toward more growth and we're going to move toward more productivity, and that means yeah. more automation, okay, so then what for the people who are uh, may not be either gifted mm -hmm. to, to do some of the manual labor that will remain right. to be done, uh, or that great bulk of people who are going to try to find new sorts of work. I, I know that you've thought about what kind of work people I have. will find. Yeah, and a, and a lot of it, of course, set aside, as we said, sort of the trade skills. In fact, I think, honestly, if you're right now trying to decide between that women's studies degree at a state university or becoming an apprentice as an electrician, go with the apprenticeship. <laughs> Trust me on this. This is a bad idea to Can run up with that. women's studies majors be easily replaced by machines? Uh, well, they won't need to be because most of them, <laughs> unfortunately, aren't creating value, right? And so unless your plan right. is to be a, a corporate agitator or something like that, there's not a lot of hope. Nice work if yeah, can. exactly. But I mean, I, the, the irony here is that, of course, what economists say is that uh, economic growth comes about when you reduce the amount of input relative to output. So the less labor you can put in and get more of the goods or services you have, that's, that's what economic growth is about. It's what it's always been about since the first person lit a controlled fire is about doing that. Uh, the irony, though, is the assumption is that, well, once machines are doing everything, that will leave us with nothing to do. But think about Seattle as a perfect example why this isn't true. So we've gotten more and more and more productive at making coffee. So if all you want to do is simply drink a cup of coffee, you can do it for one or two cents. And yet everyone in Seattle, everyone in the United States, spends a lot of money on more and more specialized and refined coffee made by, by hand by baristas. I spend 10 times more for a handmade Thai than I do for a Thai made by machine in China. I think what is going to happen is that specialty labor and bespoke labor and service are going to, again, uh, become a major part of the workforce. So that, you, you know, we all watched Downton Abbey for several seasons when it was on 
BBC, and we were glad to imagine, okay, that's, we wouldn't want to live in a world like that. But what I actually think is going to happen is that many of the people that are now working uh, in factories uh, might actually end up being uh, uh, help for it, it, butlers and footmen, for instance, in uh, so for some of the wealthier Americans. I think that, um, for instance, once you have housekeepers that can uh, – be replaced by robots, I actually think human housekeepers become a luxury good. And I think we're already seeing a, a lot of that happening. That's why there's uh, interest in microbrews. There's interest in organic farming and in local farming. What that is is it's humans suddenly valuing the labor that we used to treat as an input as an output. So well, there, there are two questions that immediately arise. When you talk about people giving up manufacturing jobs and then yeah. working as butlers and yeah. maids and footmen and uh, it it sounds horrible it sounds like you're right. you're widening social divisions mm -hmm. even beyond what they are today that also goes to something else which is that one of the the aspects of robots of of mm -hmm. human replacements that you discuss uh has to do with sexuality yes. and human companionship uh they're pretty close to marketing are they Absolutely. not Absolutely. Uh, some uh, basically sex bots. How how is that supposed to work? Well, it's it's uh, in fact uh, I, I won't name the company because I don't want to give them free publicity. But there's no, a I'm company sure that get actually released uh, the AI online, essentially so that people that were planning to buy these robots could start to train uh, the AI, the artificial intelligence, in its preferences. And so this was released as an app, and then it's attached to these, these very sophisticated. Uh, they're not sex dolls. They're sex robots. The heads are very complex. They're almost lifelike. I think they haven't quite gotten there. Um, I don't know what, quite, what to say about the morality of the fact that perhaps the, the, the world's oldest profession might actually be replaced by robots. But it's a, I, it, I find it to be a deeply morally troubling prospect that it's essentially what we could have and what I think is already happening in countries like Japan is that many, many isolated men actually are going to prefer the companionship well, this of this is one of those things. I, I know that's something that a lot of observers have uh, been contemplating mm. with horror yes. is the fact that in China, uh, because of the one-child policy yes. that they enforced for years, they have tons more men and that's who are right. coming Millions of more. age and who simply will not be able to find no. wives because they don't have a lot of immigration to no, China. No, that's right. So could this provide some kind of solution for all those unattached and lonely men in China? Well, uh, whether it's a solution or not, I think it's going to happen. And I think it's going to be used. In fact, there, there have been stories for the last several years I've followed. At, Michael, as a process of working on this book, I put sex robots in my Google alerts just so I could follow this. And the reality is that this is going to be a, a, a real part of human civilization going forward. I, now, I don't think these are going to be conscious Robots. These are not going to be strong AIs that become persons. They're machines. But is this is this uh, when you are talking about the moral dimension? Do you think it's morally more problematic to have sex with a robot, or, or morally more problematic to have sex with a human being you're paying for it, who's a stranger? This is I, I honestly I, my my intuition is that it's is that prostitution is worse. But it yeah. does. It, I, we're comparing two bads, right? We're not comparing a good and a bad. I suspect that's probably, especially, obviously, if we're talking about sex slaves, well, at least, I mean, to speak brutally, what, what these companies are doing is they're finding sophisticated ways for wealthy men to masturbate. That's essentially what they're doing. Um, okay, well, that's not a good thing, but it's better than sex trafficking. So then this is the arguments of the companies, is that we will destroy sex trafficking because there'll be no market for it. This is just it's one part of the dynamic, kind of the darker, the seedier side of the increased automation and robotification that is going to happen. We see it slowly right now. The reality is most of this placement is still in the future. Okay, we have just a few moments left. Um, Rip Van Winkle, mm. uh, you're asleep for 20 years. Uh, you, you wake up from this cryogenic suspension or whatever it is. Uh, do you think that uh, the world will be massively uglier or more beautiful because of the advent of these machines? I think it depends on what we do. I think if we lose virtue, uh, it will be vastly uglier. But I think if we simply use these machines to do what they're supposed to do, which is to make us more productive, to, to bring down the price of things that human beings need, and to allow us to do higher valued things, things that are uniquely human with our creativity, with our, with our creative freedom, I think the world could be much cleaner, it could be uh, much less poor, and it could be much more beautiful. 
Uh, but a lot of that is honestly entirely dependent on, on how we use these things. Well, it's dependent on us to continue this conversation because there's so much more to talk about. I, uh, I so much appreciate, Jay Richards, uh, for your ability to address a subject that uh, deserves intense attention. And that's true of all of the subjects that we bring forward with uh, Great Minds with Michael Medved, this great series that uh, is provided, sponsored by Discovery Institute. Now, you can uh, go to our homepage to read more about Jay's work and his extraordinarily provocative reflections on this and many other subjects. Go to our home port, mindswithmedved.com. That's mindswithmedved.com. And while you're there, please subscribe to Great Minds with Michael Medved and do yourself the favor, and us the favor too, of donating to make sure that the conversation continues on this program. Thanks so much for joining us. 